an interesting phenomenon that arises due to predator-prey interactions is mimicry. So let's look at that and also at modeling predation. With mimicry, you often have brightly colored, aposematically colored species being copied by other species that are palatable. For example, the monarch butterflies, which are toxic because their caterpillars eat milkweed, are mimicked by viceroy butterflies, <clears throat> whose caterpillars eat more palatable plants. The butterflies Monarchs are poisonous to predators, like blue jays, but viceroys are not. They have the same color pattern and are usually avoided by predators who've eaten a monarch in the past. So that kind of mimicry of a toxic model by a palatable mimic is called Batesian mimic, mimicry because a scientist named Bates described it the first time. And in this kind, you can see how if the mimics become too common, the predators will start eating them and learn that they're palatable. So for this kind of mimicry to be successful, the mimics have to be less abundant than the models. Here are some Batesian mimics of the venomous, dangerous wasp model by two other kinds of insects that look an awful lot like a wasp here, but the one in B is a mantid, like a praying mantis, and in C it's a moth, colored and shaped very much like a wasp, so maybe it will be avoided by predators. The other kind of mimicry was described by Mueller, so it's called Mullerian mimicry, and this is where unpalatable organisms come to look like each other. So we can talk about Mullerian mimicry rings. In these groups, some of the species are more palatable than others, and that's because some of them also serve as models for palatable species, and so in Mullerian mimicry rings, there sometimes are associated Batesian mimics. All of this kind of mimicry involves avoidance learning by predators and more efficient when reinforced by others that are toxic. So in the case of these Mullerian mimicry rings, a bad experience eating a toxic butterfly of one species will protect the other species that look like it. So in a ring, you might have some species that are really toxic and others that are just somewhat toxic or maybe just taste bad. There are a few words I want to make sure you understand the difference between. We know that predators eat prey and by definition they consume or kill their prey using more than one prey individual during their lifetime normally. Parasites, on the other hand, spend all of their life in or on one host individual and often doesn't kill that host. Now some parasite life cycles are a little more complicated. They have successive hosts of different species. But anyway, parasites usually don't kill their hosts. Then there are parasitoids, which are a little like both. A parasitoid develops all in a single host individual, but it kills that host. And these kinds of organisms, parasitoids, are only known in arthropods. And in butterflies and other arthropods, there may be parasitoids at any stage of the life history. There are some egg parasitoids, larval parasitoids, and pupil parasitoids, and sometimes parasitoids attack one stage and emerge in another stage. Now, in addition to these, I want you to think about herbivores, because sometimes they can be like a predator, sometimes they can be more like a parasite. 
an herbivore that's big in relation to the plant it eats could kill and or consume and kill that plant. But if they're small, they may spend their whole life on a plant and then not kill the plant and in that way act like a parasite. Oops, I see that this should be parasite, not parasitoid. In this photo, you see a big, beautiful orange parasitoid wasp laying her eggs inside this fuzzy black and orange caterpillar. Her eggs will hatch inside and her larvae will feed on food from the inside of the caterpillar. The caterpillar is eating the leaf. That energy is being taken up by these larvae. As the caterpillar grows, the larvae inside grow until they're ready to themselves pupate. They may emerge and spin their cocoons on the outside, leaving the caterpillar an empty shell, a dead caterpillar that will never make an adult. The lynx is an iconic predator, very typical, because during a lynx's lifetime it eats many hares. But for any predator, it's important to know which of the factors affect its rate of predation. Three important quantities or entities are search time, how long it takes a predator to locate its prey, handling time, how long it takes for that lynx to catch a hare, gobble it up, pull out the fuzzy parts, etc. Or in, here's a vegetarian gorilla eating a banana, peeling it and disposing of the peel in a very ecologically sound way. And the third thing is satiation. In the real world, predators eventually get full. So how many prey does it take to fill up a predator? A fun experiment to do in class, I think that this may be something people do in lab also, is to look at how density of prey affects search time and how familiarity affects handling time and also how satiety, satiety, predator satiation affects feeding rate. Here are some other curves that are important to know about as an ecologist. These are called functional response curves of predators in, that is in response to prey density. There are three different types of functional responses. In the first, the predator consumes prey in constant proportion regardless of density. So unaffected by density. This is the straight line in the upper graph. These are two ways of looking at the same thing. The upper graph has on the y-axis the number of prey eaten per predator and the x-axis prey density. The lower graph, the x-axis is also prey density or victim density, but the y-axis is the proportion of prey consumed. So it's a direct relationship in the upper graph, but a straight line, horizontal line in the second graph. Type 2 functional response curves show the predation rate decreasing as the predator gets full. So in the upper graph, this looks almost like a logistic growth curve leveling off with predator getting full. The lower graph shows decreasing proportion of prey eaten as the predator eats and gets full. And type 3 shows a lag at low prey density due to low hunting efficiency or undeveloped search image. So in the upper graph it's lower than you would expect and then it catches up and increases. And in the lower graph, low and then higher and lower as the predator gets full. 
an important equation looking at the functional response type 2 was derived from experiments conducted with blindfolded people finding paper discs on a table surface. There are, is evidence that handling and searching time both affect functional response time. Feeding time is a function of both search time and handling time. And feeding rate, that is the number eaten over unit time, is equal to the capture rate times the density of the predator divided by the quantity 1 plus little c, the capture rate, times density of the predator. Oh, actually, is our prey. That, excuse me, prey density and handling time. In these abbreviations, predator and prey both start with a P. So sometimes the prey is indicated by an R or sometimes by a V for victim. The R stands for resource. So here in the lotka volterra model, for predator-prey interactions, we saw before the competition models, P stands for predator, R for resource or prey. The change in prey populations over time is a function of the density of both prey and predator, and the change in predator populations over time is another function of predator and prey density. Prey population increase exponentially without the presence of predators. So dr dt equals little r times r, the density of prey. But it decreases when predators are present, catching the prey. C is the capture rate. So we have to modify that increase in prey population, dr dt, by subtracting the capture rate times the density of prey times the density of predator. And this is assuming type 1 functional response. More resources, more prey, the greater number of captures. Stop rubbing on this, Frody. The change in predator numbers over time is equal to little a, the conversion efficiency, how efficiently the predator turns prey into its own body um, mass, and the term little crp, capture rate times density of prey and predator, which is basically the birth term of the predator. Subtract from that d, the death rate of the predator times the density of the predator. So just as we did for the competition equations, we can look at these equilibrium solutions in a phase plane with the density of prey along the x-axis, density of predator along the y. The equilibrium number of predators is equal to little r, the intrinsic growth rate of the prey, divided by c, the capture rate, and you can see that along the predator number line, the, the y-axis, if we draw a line little r divided by c, that is the prey isocline dr dt equals zero. So this shows that at equilibrium, the predator is keeping the prey at zero growth. And on the right is the equilibrium density of prey, which is equal to D, the death rate of the predator, divided by A times C, the conversion efficiency. So that intersects the prey axis, the x-axis, and that's the zero growth line for predators, dp, dt equals zero. So if Let's look at the left-hand graph now. If the density of prey is above this line, 
it decreases to the left in the x direction. If the density of prey is below that line, it increases to the right in the x direction. And for prey, if it's above the prey's isocline, excuse me, if it's above the predator's isocline on the graph on the right, dp dt equals zero. The behavior of this model is that if the density of prey and predator is in this quadrant, the prey numbers, excuse me, the predator numbers will increase. If it's in this half, they'll decrease. Putting those two things together, there's only one possible pattern of isoclines crossing in predator-prey interactions. In each quadrant, remember that you uh, look at the two vectors, in this one predators increase, prey decrease, and their sum is in the middle like that. Here, prey decreasing, predator decreasing, and so it goes this way. Here, prey is increasing, predator is decreasing, goes in this direction, and so on. So what you get is this ellipse traced predator and prey cycling unless predator and prey are exactly here in the middle. To me what's very interesting about this ellipse is that if you put on the x-axis instead of prey density time and n on the y-axis and plot the densities of predator and prey you get that typical predator-prey cycle with prey increasing and then predator increasing following. Prey decreases and then predator decreases, etc., etc. So you get that typical predator-prey cycling with a periodicity of 2 pi divided by the square root of little r times d. And it's interesting to note that the predator is displaced one quarter cycle from the prey. So this model, like all, has assumptions. And this is that of specialization, that the growth of the prey is limited only by the predator, and that the predator eats only that particular prey. The other assumption is that individual predators have unlimited capacity so that there's no interference or cooperation at high prey densities. In other words, a type 1 functional response is assumed. No predator satiation, although this could stabilize the model. Another assumption is that predator and prey encounters take place at random in a homogeneous environment. Let's look a little more closely at what happens with type 3 a functional response. Often this is due to the Ali effect. Normally, as populations grow, birth rate decreases and death rate increases as density increases. But with the Ali effect, birth rate increases as the population gets bigger and death rate decreases. And this may be due to the benefit of having more individuals around or maybe due to predator numbers times density, that is, times 1 over handling time. That is, it's more difficult for the predator to find the prey, catch them, or handle them when the predator is unfamiliar with the prey. So at very low densities, the encounters are few, and it takes more encounters for the predator to figure out how to catch that mouse. So it's cool to look at interactions between pathogens and their hosts, and that many of them can be described using this 
SIR model, S-I-R, S for susceptible, I for infected, R for recovered individuals, and these lines show, the dark line is the line of susceptible individuals, starting high, falling, as more individuals become infected. And then some of those infected individuals recover, so then infected individuals fall. The dynamics of these lines change somewhat depending on the virulence of the disease. If the disease is really deadly, not too many recover. But with almost any disease, some recover. And this doesn't address this specifically, but once infected, then resistant in the future. One disease that's been really devastating to the herpetofauna of the tropics is uh, chytrid fungal infections of amphibians. Many species of beautiful little frogs have just disappeared over the last few decades. And this line shows how the fungus has spread gradually through Panama and Costa Rica. And I actually did my own PhD work in the highlands of Costa Rica in the early 80s, actually 79 through 81, 82. And many of the frogs I knew from that time were no longer there five or ten years later when I was taking groups of students to Costa Rica. Another term I want to make sure you're familiar with is keystone species. Sometimes a keystone species is a predator, sometimes it's not. But these are organisms that have a much greater role than it would seem apparent by just their abundance. And this is because these organisms are essential to the structure of the community and be because of their inordinate influence. Sometimes it's because these predators are keeping competition of the lower trophic levels um, in line, and so they their presence makes things much more diverse at the lower trophic levels. So you, you know that large mammals are often top predators, wolves and lions and tigers, but ants also may be keystone species, important predatory species like fire ants. And in the intertidal, you know about sea stars from those competition experiments of Connell and the other ones of Robert Payne.